fishes, um, looking at big trees in fishes and thinking about the evolution of uh, functional morphology and also community structure in coral reef fishes with a focus today on the Red Sea. So these are a couple characters, some of my favorite fishes, parrot fishes and wrasses that will that'll sort of star in the, in the talk today. Um, Karen Cranston said to me uh, a while ago, if we had the whole tree of life, what would we do with it? And it's kind of a fun thing to think about. Um, and many of us are generating large phylogenetic trees now and starting to layer data onto them. And this is a real important focus of our field. So my objectives today are to talk about new trees, some, some of them large, for, for various groups of reef fishes. To focus in on some biogeographic questions with a particular focus on the Red Sea, which I'm thinking about, and then, and then a short foray to global patterns. And then to look at evolutionary patterns and function, both in the, uh, just briefly at the end, function of the jaws and function of the fins. So I've been lucky enough to uh, be associated with a field museum over most of my career and have been to a lot of really cool places collecting fishes. Um, and I'd just like to make the point here that primary collections of natural history specimens, going out and collecting your animals, taking careful geo-referenced records from those and depositing those specimens in a collection is super important. We get fresh tissues, we get uh, fresh color patterns, we get a lot of the kinds of traits and information that we want to layer onto the phylogeny. And so a lot of these uh, expeditionary trips out into the Pacific and and uh, Philippines, and this was a great trip to the Despenseranas off the coast of Chile, um, are, are sort of the basis for the work I'll talk about today. So just to put a little focus on, on a question for the biogeographic section of the talk, the biogeography of the Red Sea is really interesting because the Red Sea has gone through repeated episodes of high salinity and even drying, where it's thought that coral, reef, uh, coral reefs and the coral reef fishes on them, they have gone completely extinct from the Red Sea multiple times within a time frame of even the last 100,000 years and back, back through the last 10 million years. And so the question is, how is the community of current Red Sea reef fishes, which is populated with many endemics and a really interesting fauna, how is it related to and assembled from the phylogenetic relationships of fishes that live in the northern Indian Ocean, the Indian Ocean more broadly, or for the Pacific? So we'll be using some of the phylogenetics to get at that. So we're, uh, uh, we've been taking the tissue samples that we collected over the years from these families, the trigger fishes and file fishes, some of Charlie McCord's work, butterfly fishes and angel fishes, Jeff Bessler's work, damsel fishes, Jish Cooper's work, and rasses and parrot fishes, a whole bunch of us, um, using still uh, today uh, Sanger sequencing to collect a number of genetic loci for phylogenetics. And and using uh, typical sort of partition models, Mr. Bayes and based on Cypress. Uh, the Cypress supercomputer cluster is like the best thing, uh, the best thing um, other than Tracy Heath's postdoc that the uh, Cypress project funded. Um, so, and we do visualization in Mesquite and, and using uh, some phylogeographic things in R. So, the first uh, example of a phylogeny is Charlie McCord's work. Um, she presented on this a couple of days ago, and so she has sort of solidified the phylogenetic relationships of the trigger fishes that um, uh, Mike Alfaro and, and Francesco Santini have worked on, and she's got some really nice uh, solid support for some of the uh, file fish clades as well, which are really weird animals, and, and she's here, so she'd be happy to talk to you about that part. Um, moving to some of the groups that we're going to look at in regards to the Red Sea, um, Jen Fessler's work um, eight years ago on the butterfly fishes, she did the first analysis of butterfly fishes mapping on the rather interesting biogeographic history of the butterfly fishes with multiple invasions and origins in the Atlantic versus the Indo-Pacific versus uh, things like uh, the Caribbean, things like that. And so we're building on her tree to generate a new tree of 105 out of uh, 129 species. And as a community, we're getting pretty close to an all-species tree for the Keats, which is fun, because he's a really neat fish. So, so for the next few trees, the red branches are from the Red Sea. 
The green branches are residents of the Red Sea that also live elsewhere. And blue then is Indian Ocean relatives of these clays. And so right away we can sort of get an answer to the Red Sea community assembly question by seeing that Red Sea heats come from literally every single clay in the family. So the community of Red Sea butterfly fishes is sort of assembled from this broad phylogeny. It's not one clay or something that's, that's gone crazy. So if we, if we run a likelihood model in the dispersal extinction clay to genesis model of Rick Ree, um, who built that in the range, and this example of it is implemented in, in Nick Matzke's uh, BioGeo Bears, we can see that the ancient origins of butterfly fishes, the pie charts are all black and chopped up, which means that the, the ancestral um, area is somewhat uncertain. Um, Indian Ocean is in blue, and you can see a lot of blue here. The Pacific is in green, and it looks like these butterfly fishes are likely to have had a, many of them have had a Pacific origin. The Red Sea here is in red, and you don't see any red. And it appears that Red Sea is being rejected as an ancestral origin area for the Keats. So all of the Keats in the Red Sea appear to have migrated into the Red Sea from other area. If we jump to the damsel fishes, this is Jim Cooper. Um, he's worked a lot on damsel fishes. This is the base of his tree. Uh, we use this data plus some data that, uh, that Bruno Friedrich collected in Alfaro's lab and we're assembling a, another big tree. This is a big tree of homocentrids on a, on a time scale here. And one of the challenges of big trees is we get them, but we can't really show them to you, right? Uh, we pick in, they're hard to see. So I put red arrows where the Red Sea endemics are. You can kind of see some green out here at the tips. Those are residents from elsewhere. And so this part of the tree and this part of the tree have a lot of Red Sea endemics. Well, how does that work in terms of an ancestral state reconstruction? Here's the deck plus J model in BioGeo Bears, and you can see that the Pacific origin, at least in this tree, which is a little heavy on Pacific fishes, um, is, is highly favored over, uh, say, an Indian Ocean origin, although Indian Ocean here and here pops up. Atlantic and pink shows up here. You can see a little red. So there's Red Sea origin here, and uh, uh, there's one other place where Red Sea sort of peeks through. Um, but uh, just in Pomocentris, maybe a reasonable likelihood that about 18 million years ago, there may have been some cladistic origin in the Red Sea for Pomocentris. What about the Rassus, my favorite group? This uh, is based on uh, work that Mike Alfaro and I did now 10 years ago. Um, and so we took that data set. Uh, we added a data set that um, Lydia Smith from Berkeley uh, led us on, also with Mike and Todd Streelman and Jen Fessler, and, and worked out some of the relationships with the parrot fishes. And we've also gotten some data from Peter Kalman's work, who's going to uh, talk next. And so when we run all that, we get a 450 out of 620 species tree. This one is color coded by taxonomy, because I want to make a quick point here about taxonomy. The taxonomy in rats is a mess. This is a family of Dacity. This huge red thing is a family uh, scarity. And there are lots of color pattern mixing here showing that the current taxonomy is not reflecting the phylogeny. Well, let's focus in on this group. These are the temperate wrasses, the Maori wrasses, and the parrot fishes. And we're going to have to circle around, as Rick Reed, uh, pushed us to yesterday, circle around and use our phylogenetics to make a contribution to taxonomy. So we've got these three families that are all together in this group, and we're going to propose a classification, which is going to be a single family laboratory with subfamilies for the parrot fishes and things like that. This is uh, somewhat controversial, but we have all of these available names for this really interesting group, and we'll probably use many of these names to designate subfamilies in the group. So, so the scarity will go away. And so what did the rats say to the parrotfish worried about taxonomic name changes? It's okay, don't be scared. <laughs> <laughs> and that's credit to Amy McDermott for that too. <laughs> So, so back to the Red Sea wrasse question. Um, these are all Red Sea wrasses endemics around here. They're all over the place except right in the base. Wrasses 
This is the Declos J model. We see lots of red. We see red up here in Mandrofringina. We see it here. We see it, a big chunk of Terragogus, which dates back to 20 million years ago as originating in the Red Sea. The, uh, the origins of these things are really rich, and so there is strong Red Sea origin in the morasses. If we take a global look at a deck model for this, we see lots of richness, and I apologize, Red Sea is a red here this time. Red Sea is orange, I got the order mixed up, but you see the orange Red Sea origins in the same places. Red is Indian Ocean, <coughs> green is Pacific, so there's lots of interesting, just constant radiation of these fishes throughout the past sort of 30 million years. If we do a phylogenetic community dispersion analysis looking at these three families, this is NRI and NTI, High numbers mean that close relatives diversified there, but the keats are mostly random and they're or under dispersed. The grasses that are highly over dispersed, these negative numbers mean that they've been plucked from all over. They've been plucked from all over the phylogeny, meaning that they're highly over dispersed, implying some kind of competition or something, which would be something to test. And then homocentrics, specifically in the Red Sea, are also over dispersed. What else can we do with big trees? We can map jaws and biomechanics on it. These are some lower jaws from wrasses, and they can either be forceful or fast or intermediate. So we can map that on the tree. We can, we can do some quantitative biomechanics of these things to get a nice trait layer on function. And if we map that on a slightly smaller tree of 300 wrasses, we can see that these fast jaws for capturing evasive prey have evolved at least 20 times independently. So this is one of the things you can do with a big tree if you have a neat uh, layer of trait data. We can also look at fin shape diversity. I'm working with Brett Galeo and Melina Hale on this. Um, high aspect ratio fins are used for flying through the water. They flap them vertically, whereas these paddle shaped fins are used for rowing. And we can map that onto a, this uh, phylogenetic tree of 318 species. And Brett showed this the other day. And you see the parrotfishes and stethodulus and thalassoma and a number of other groups with about 14 independent evolutionary events of a high aspect ratio of fin. So we're also looking, we're trying to get at what Karen Cranston was urging us to. If we get a tree of all forms, what are we going to do with it? So we're trying to develop a tree of all fishes, uh, uh, particularly with John Lundberg and another number of other people. And we're grafting this one together. We're not analyzing a big data set. So here's a big grafted mega tree of all fishes at the family level. It's uh, 920 taxa, and it starts at lampreys and hagfishes and goes all the way up to the crown of coral reef fishes and stuff up here. And I just mapped a preliminary bite force character on there. The fast jaws uh, are, in, are the speedy jaws are in red, and the heavy biting jaws are in blue. And it's a really interesting distribution, right? So you get these big chunks of blue biters interspersed with multiple. I haven't counted them, but probably 50 origins of suction feeding throughout fishes. So this is a way that's kind of make a map of where to explore the biomechanics and functional morphology of fishes. So um, thinking about big trees is a lot of fun. We're going to be doing a lot of thinking about big trees and data layers to put on in this conference and workshop series that we have coming up. I'd be interested to talk to people about this. It's called FutureFi. Please join us on FutureFi.org or, or tweet at us at FutureFi. Thank you very much.